thank you, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Uh, House Amendment Number One is a gut and replace amendment, and it is the annual omnibus uh, uh, changes and corrections to the election code. Its main purpose is you know, has several sections in it. One measures to continue to guarantee you know, the broadest possible ballot access to uh, those who wish to vote. There are also provisions which deal with election security and protecting the viability of our election process, which we all know right now is a very hot topic because you know, there are active, uh, uh, proven active efforts to potentially interfere in every single phase of our election process by hostile actors. So uh, a lot of attention is being paid to that. Uh, it also clarifies in several cases where there have been discrepancies in court rulings or discrepancies in how the State Board of Election has interpreted the statute. There are areas where the, we attempt to clarify the statute so that you know, outcomes of you know, certain cases will be, you know, it will be clear how folks should proceed in these cases. It's a uh, long and complicated bill. It has a lot of pieces in it. I'm not going to go through all of that. Interestingly, I was you know, sitting next to Mr. James from the clerks as I came in, and she was going through you know, a lot of the concerns they had and questions about certain aspects of it, which as I listened to, I thought, you know, there's a lot of interesting perspective there uh, on ways we can continue to improve this. And you know, I, I said to her, you know, this is something we continue to work on you know, through the summer and maybe up till November if there are ways we can uh, you know, clarify some of these things, make them better, and make them more efficient uh, for both the voters and the, those who administer elections. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Leader, uh, before we go to questions, we have two proponents, Matthew Slade, self-appearance only, Thomas Bride, appearance only. Uh, we do have three opponents, Gretchen DeJanes, Illinois Association of County Clerks and Recorders, oral, Patrick Berry, County Clerks Association, oral, Jessica Fox, appearance only. Are you Gretchen? Uh, you wish to say a few words in opposition? Come to the table, please. And Patrick Berry as well. Uh, before we go to questions, we'd like to hear from both of you. Just state your name and, and proceed. I'm Gretchen DeJanes. I'm the county clerk in McDonough County and the chairperson of the County Clerk and Recorders Association Legislative Committee. And, and I would like to say thank you for your time. I know this is horribly busy for, we, for you, and you are all ready to be out of here. My other comment is if we had a, a box that said concerns rather than opposed, we are certainly not opposed to this bill. There are just some concerns that we have with it. There's a lot of the parts that we, we most definitely want. One of our concerns is with the pilot program for sending applications to any voter who requested a ballot in the 2018 general election. We as county clerks would love to see a permanent ab uh, absentee voter list. We would like to give the voter the opportunity to opt into a program rather than them getting a piece of mail that they don't really understand why they got. You know, a lot of times we have people who will vote absentee pretty well every election, but maybe this particular election, they go to Florida every year. Maybe this particular election, somebody was ill, they had a grandchild getting married, you know, a family event that kept them home. We have some concerns about where we would send these applications. We would really just like to have the permanent list that allows the voter to control their ballot to control their application. We would know where it would be sent, you know, all the time. They would know. They would have instructions. We could send mailings to them, giving them the opportunity to opt into a program. We've just found with our association that opting in is better than getting them something that they, they don't know why they got it. When we went to um, any organization being allowed to send an application for an absentee ballot, two voters. We had, everybody had calls. Okay, we got this. We didn't request it. Why did we get it? We have a little concern with this program that maybe that same voter is now going to get three applications for an absentee ballot. We thought we already did this. Now we've got another application. You know, we just think there is some cleanup. 
we think maybe there is a program that would work just a little bit better. And I can say we've already talked about that. <clears throat> if we do keep this language, we would like it to say qualified registered voters rather than anyone who got a ballot in 2018, just specifically because people move, people, you know, there's, there's circumstances that change. Another section that we had a little bit of a concern with was taking an absentee application by email. Cybersecurity is such a hot topic. You know, we have worked, we are working obviously with um, SBE, with STIC, with several organizations. Cybersecurity is just a, a real hot topic. In the April election, we just had a county clerk who in some mailings, in some emails, dealing with an application for an absentee ballot, got a Trojan virus attached to an email. It was not, it was a viable email address. The person had sent it, but in the process of it being sent and being received, someone had attached a virus. This, the county clerk did not open it, didn't um, infect their system. However, it could have, and you know, two days before an election, there would be nothing more fun than to drop our, our voter registration systems. We certainly, as an organization, never, ever, ever want to refuse a, a ballot for postage. Um, I understand that happened. That was, that is not, I mean, our, our association would 100% pick, agree, I mean, we are very happy that you put in that we would pick up the ballot, even if it's postage due. That is something that is a practice with the association and we're, we hated that that happened somewhere. Um, okay. Patrick Berry. Patrick Berry representing the county clerks. Uh, just to reiterate, you know, uh, Lear Harris's his comments on uh, the vote by mail program. This just addresses the absent, those that requested an absentee ballot or a vote by mail ballot uh, in the last election. The clerks again would, would like this to go to, in, in Leader Harris's word, broad as possible, mm -hmm. and instead of limiting it to just those, we'd like to send it to every, uh, every voter out there that's registered. Um, the other thing that would be, just one note, would be the two business days required for notification on mail. Uh, if we get a rejected ballot, and we do not have an email address in which to send that per person the notice that it's been rejected. Our only other option would be actual snail mail, and the two-day requirement would be an issue. But again, just to button up, the, the, the Clerks Association is not opposed to legislation. We would, we would rather have a permanent voter roll. We pointed out some other small things in here we think that can help uh, with the process. Uh, as Leader Harris said, we want to address bad actors and make this as broad as possible. Uh, and in that, we would uh, also request that perhaps, and we go on into uh, further discussions on the legislation, that the mandate for five judges at each precinct would be lowered to three. Not that we'd be looking to move judges around where we have five, but where we struggle to get them, we would like that lowered to three. Uh, other than that, we'd be open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you both uh, for your concerns. Um, any questions? Uh, of Leader Harris before we proceed. Representative Butler, then Spain, <clears throat> then Sosnowski. Butler, Thank Spain, Sosnowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Leader, uh, I, I like how you um, <laughs> portray this bill as the annual omnibus bill. I would probably take a little bit of exception to that. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday who's been around here for a while who who made the point that, you know, election bills used to be done in a bipartisan manner around here. And it, but it's been quite a while since we've seen election bills But it's been quite a while since we've seen election bills done in a bipartisan manner around here. Um, I've had multiple. We're going to have conversations. Let's take them out of the room, please. I've had multiple election bills out there for quite a long time. They get bottled up left and right. How long have you been working on this piece of legislation? Actually, I'm relatively new to it. I've only gotten involved. Okay, in how, how long has the agency been working on this? The, the State Board of Elections been working on their omnibus elections bill? I would defer to them to answer that. Yeah, I mean, this is, is this something you guys have been working on all spring? Can you state your name for the record? 
Angela Ryan, State Board of Elections. Yes, we introduced bills early on. This, these particular provisions? Uh, many of them, yes. Okay. Um, Leader Harris, let's, let's get to the heart of the matter here. So page 51 of your piece of legislation, line 10. Um, it says, a political party which at the general election beginning in 2018 cast 5% or more of the vote cast for governor within any legislative or representative district is hereby declared to be a political party for purposes of Article 7 and Article 8 within such legislative or representative district and shall nominate its candidates for representative or senator in the general election on the provisions thereof. Can you tell me which political party that is particular to? Uh, I think in this uh, situation, it would be the Constitutional Party, is that correct? Conservative Party, Conservative Party. In the and can, last you, can, you can you tell me why you, you, you picked 2018? Why not 2014, 2008, 1995, 1994? Well, why actually, do we do 2018? Actually, you know, the, the other situation where this came up was not those years. It was in 2006 with Rich Whitney and uh, the Green Party of Illinois. Okay. And in those situations, you know, the, the uh, statute was interpreted different ways as to how it would uh, apply to uh, districts that were for state reps and senators. While there's more clarity, I believe, on how this issue would be addressed in larger districts like members of Congress and things like that, there was you know, ambiguity or perceived to be ambiguity in how uh, state rep and senate districts So did, did we address that at the time, after the Green Party in 2006? Well, then, I, as I understand it, uh, there was a different interpretation. Do we address it in statute? I, if, I, if I can answer the question, I, hopefully I can tell you. So there were two different interpretations by the State Board of Elections in those uh, similar circumstances. This would clarify by which means that should be handled. Did we address the 2016 Green Party issue in statute back then? Uh, our, I, I'm not personally aware. And our so why are we addressing it now? If we didn't address it back in 2016 when the Green Party, which let's get to the heart of the matter here, would impact Democrats more in elections than it would in Republicans, how come you didn't address it back in 2006? Because in 20, uh, one reason would be in 2006 it was an isolated instance that was interpreted one way. Then we come uh, to this last election where there was a similar instance interpreted a different way. Therefore, you have a split in decisions, and that would trigger an interest in clarifying the matter. Isn't, isn't that the election? State Board of Elections job to interpret those? But when you have uh, the same organization interpreting things in two different ways. Why 2018 with the Conservative Party on the ballot? Because that was the uh, circumstance that triggered the uh, difference in the opinion of the State Board. So can, you, that, can you give me um, election results in, for the Conservative Party in any, any Democrat uh, legislative districts? I don't have those breakdowns okay. in front of me. All right. Um, let's see here. Page 90, line 11, and let me get there because it's, as you said, a large, complicated bill. Page 90, line 11, the vote by mail <laughs> pilot program no more than 90 days, nor less than 45 days before the general election in 2020, each election authority shall deliver an application for a vote by mail that meets the requirements of this article to any registered voter within the jurisdiction who submitted an application by, to vote by mail in the 2018 general election. An election authority may deliver the application by U.S. mail or email. Why? To encourage people to vote and to recognize that those who voted by uh, uh, vote by mail in the previous election would likely have an interest in voting in the subsequent election and to give them the earliest and easiest opportunity to once again avail them, uh, themselves of that means of voting. I think we heard from Clerk DeJanes that they were, they were interested in working, working on that. Um, and I said and to Clerk DeJanes that we're interested in working too and we'd be happy to work Okay, with so if you'd like summer. to pull, from, pull this bill from the record, we'd be happy to work on it over the summer. No, I think we can work on a trailer bill. <laughs> Famous last words around here trailer bill. So page 96, 
line 10, I believe, the postage issue, which we heard about as well, which I certainly uh, agree that it should not be refused. Um, but why are we mandating this, uh, that our clerks have to have to do this? I mean, shouldn't that be up to the individual clerks that were elected by their, their counties to, to be able to determine that? I, I, in my opinion, it should be up to us to make sure that every single ballot is counted and there can't be an excuse like, well, we didn't want to go down and pay the postage to deprive people of their right to vote. Can you, can you anticipate a situation where, where a candidate or a party would encourage people to send back their, um, their ballots without um, affixing postage? A concerted effort by a candidate or a party to not affix postage so the cost of it would go upon the county clerk instead of the individual sending back their ballot? I don't know what. All right, so let me, like. let me refer to a post from uh, 2018 from uh, uh, Tony Tel Del Giorno, who is a, a county board uh, member here in Sangamon County. And if you look at his, his post where he posts the story from Time Magazine, it says, Postal Service will deliver your mail-in ballot without stamp. Good to know if Sangamon County can afford a selfie station for early voting and could afford, afford some postage. So he's encouraging his voters in an election season to not affix postage to their mail-in ballot. So I can certainly envision a campaign by parties to, you know, have people massive amounts of these ballots coming back without affixing postage, and then the cost would then be borne, a substantial cost could be borne upon the, upon the, the county. I know, I know some of my colleagues have other questions as well. I just, I, I, is, uh, is it your intention to bring forth an additional amendment after this one? This is the bill I have today. Is it have your it. intention to bring an additional amendment after this one? I'm not aware of any other additional amendment I'm working well, on. Well, I'm aware of talk of an additional amendment that could certainly impact what I've been told my community here in Sangamon County through some provisions about the county clerk and assessor. Is it your intention to bring back additional, an additional amendment? Because I'm very interested if... So I'm told, I just misspoke to you, that there is an amendment in the works to okay. address the capital township issue. It's not addressing it. It's gutting the way that we've done things for over 100 years. You know what? You guys can do what you want. This happens every, every session that we've seen. You come down with omnibus elections bills that screw the other party. That's what you're doing. That's what you've done for a long time. As I stated at the open, this, it used to be that elections bills were bipartisan. And I would just tell the majority, it might be long after I'm gone here, but be careful what you wish for. Be very careful what you wish for. Because one of these days, I might be dead and in the ground, but Republicans are going to hold the gavel. <laughs> and all this stuff is going to come home to roost. I urge a no vote. Representative Spain, then Selstowski. We do have session at 9.30. Representative Spain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, Representative Butler kind of covered all my questions. I, I would just say, you know, working down here, I think we all understand what we're getting into. And I've seen a lot of bills that um, present themselves with a, with a surprise poison pill. But... I can't think of, um, I've never seen a poison pill that, that literally poisons everything that we do. And down here in a place where um, I think people in, in this room and lots of people in this building earnestly do want to work together to get things done, to cooperate in a bipartisan way, to elect more people with that sensibility that want to work together. And here in this state, with this bill, we're taking ourselves uh, further in the other direction. 
while I've been here, I've championed each year redistricting reform. Not because I want to elect more Republicans, but I want more people working in this General Assembly that are aligned <coughs> towards compromise, bipartisan cooperation, and a willingness to work together. And um, Greg, I'm so disappointed uh, with the way that this is, is coming forward and taking us so far in the wrong direction with uh, the provisions that uh, were identified by Representative Butler. I urge a no vote. Representative Sandowski, then Arroyo. I want to ask uh, two questions. One on the, um, the provision that regards um, the casting of a ballot without an ID. Um, can you just explain briefly uh, what change that made? The, uh, if, I remember, if I'm understanding the provision you're referring to, this is about the curative period that if a person does not have proper identification, it gives that person uh, an extra period of time, a couple days, to be able to you know, get their valid legal ID and report to their election authority and prove their identity. Okay, and I guess from the election authorities, um, uh, state or local, how, how does that work? I mean, somebody casts a ballot, they don't have an ID, and then it's in a provisional period. Um, how is that ballot stored and identified I believe this section refers to same-day registration and not having the proper ID probably and, and the ability to cast a provisional ballot if you did not have proper ID for same-day registration was already in statute we have always had some concerns with that very specifically because if you don't have ID and you are not registered to vote we don't know what ballot to oh, give man. you so we have to go on your word that you really do do live at 123 East Main Street we hope that we give you the correct ballot. This particular section changes it. You had seven days to bring us in the proper identification for that ballot to be cast. This changes it to 14 days. Provisional ballots are not supposed to be run through a, a tabulator. They're supposed to be held. A provisional ballot always has, the, the voter always has another step to take to get a provisional ballot counted. They always have to do something, whether it's you know the ID or there are other circumstances to voting a provisional ballot. It is your greatest hope that you have educated your election judge as well enough that it doesn't get put through the tabulator, that they do understand what to do with it. Um, you know, with that being said, those election judges work two days <coughs> a year for very little money <laughs> and a very long day. Um, are there times that they probably do get run when they shouldn't? I'm sure there are, like I say. We, we rely on someone who works sometimes one day, sometimes two days a year. In McDonough County, we pay them $120 and they have to be there at five o'clock in the morning and they get out at eight or 8.30 at night. So you, you certainly- So assuming it's held properly held. Um, and it's uh, back at your office, uh, how is that then cleared up when somebody does bring in their ID and says, you know, I'm here to prove that provisional ballot you have that provisional ballot set aside and tagged for a particular. We, we would tag, we would tag it that, that it was a ballot to be counted. We have to count any mail-in ballot that is postmarked election day or prior, for that is returned by mail for up to 14 days. So at the end of that 14 days, that provisional ballot, if the voter provided what they needed to provide for it to be a, a acceptable ballot. And how would you protect anonymity in that situation? Because, um, you know, I go in and vote, goes into a machine, that ballot is in a collection of a thousand others. Um, we bring in election judges. How do you protect that? Okay. Bring in a, a, a group of election judges and they tabulate that ballot just like they would tabulate any other absentee ballot. It is, the provisional packets do have a security envelope in them just like okay. the absentee but okay smaller jurisdictions you get one of those in one precinct there's no way to sure well, I appreciate that in the interest of time I won't ask any follow-up on that particular uh, matter um, just for the sponsor um, prior representatives have addressed this I just wanted to ask in regards to this process it sounds like the county clerks raised a couple concerns there was a sounds like maybe a good program in creating a, a permanent voter role that was suggested I mean, 
and I understand that the state board may have filed some bills, certainly not all of these addressing these, these changes, but uh, how was this bill digested with the county clerks as far as input? And they've raised, you know, questions above and beyond, I think, some of the ideas that were introduced. And as, you know, Mr. James and I were talking, it's, if they have further clarifications or suggestions, we're happy to continue to work sure. with them. No, I certainly appreciate that. But I, I, guess, I guess I asked the question. There was no meetings that they were brought in to discuss and say, here's a draft and let's go back and forth and make this a better bill. Uh, no, well, we, we have been in contact with the legal staffs of uh, several of the caucuses on our broad brush concerns on, on if something were to come, but we did, we received the amendment when it was dropped yesterday morning and put together our concerns from there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Leader Arroyo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Greg, I stand to support your bill, but there's a problem that I can't let go by. When some of the members... Uh, kind of scrutinizing you and, and t intimidizing and, and threatening uh, our leader. You know, I take a offense to that. You know, when some of these other individuals come here from the other side, we treat them with respect. I expect the other side to also treat our leader with respect uh, for the threats and talking about dying and killing and all that kind of stuff. That's not acceptable for me. Uh, when they come to that table and they sit in front of them, we've always treated everybody with respect. I want to tell the people in the front row, I want my leader to be respected just like we respect their leaders, right? For you guys to start throwing all these innuendos about, oh, you watch, watch what's going to happen, watch what you act for, I think that's a threat. We don't threaten you guys, don't threaten our people. Don't threaten our leader. We respect your leader. You better damn well respect ours. Representative Wheeler, and then I'm going to close with a statement and we're going to go to vote. Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to take a moment here uh, and respond to my colleagues' recent comments here. I don't believe that anyone here disrespects Leader Harris. I consider him a friend of mine. I've never had a problem talking to you about any issue. We've been on JCAR together. We've done a lot of things together. We've disagreed about many things, always done so amicably. I believe that is also the case today. There are frustrations. This bill has some things in it that appear to be less than veiled threats to some members of the Republican Party based on how this bill is structured. I think those are reasonable things to bring forward in the committee's discussion. That has been done. I believe those were things done in a respectful manner. Maybe the way interpreted by some of my colleagues, not as much. But someday, things do turn around. And what we do for one, is to consider for the other. Had this bill been done in the bipartisan, bipartisan manner that Leader Butler suggested, I think we would not have had this discussion this way today. I would look forward to an opportunity to address some of those concerns directly before the amendment is filed. If that's suitable, Greg, I'd appreciate if we could have that discussion with Leader Butler involved. That said, at the end of the session, I know tempers are running high, and this, some of this stuff is very frustrating. Um, I'm going to leave it at that for now. And Representative, if you'd like to have a discussion with me, I'd be happy to have that with you. I don't think there's anyone who wants to take a shot. I respect all members of the caucus, both caucuses. I mean that sincerely. This bill is for everybody, not just one side. But, but I, I think that's where we differ. If you read parts of this bill, okay, Director it's comments. difficult. So I'm, I'm leaving it at that. Sponsor. We can discuss later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So let, let me say this. I've been here seven years, and I've watched Leader Greg Harris as a representative and he's an honorable man. He has always been a man of his word. I heard him today say uh, there's going to be continued work over the summer. There's going to be a trailer bill. And we all want fair elections, all of us. And when I hear our leader say that, I know that's going to happen because uh, uh, he's a man of his word. 
that these uh, trailer bill will be coming. These folks here weren't even here in opposition. They were here just stating concerns. They made that pretty clear. So I do agree with Leader Arroyo that sometimes our tone can be misinterpreted as disrespectful. And one of the things I wanted to make clear as of yesterday, we're going to respect your leaders, you're going to respect ours. You demand it, and we demand it. We have two more days that are going to be very long days, and we're not going to disrespect each other. We're going to allow this to be a respectful process. We're going to have differences on, uh, you know, philosophy, and, and we're going to allow that to be aired, but we're going to do it in a respectful manner, uh, especially in executive. Uh, we've done a great job this session, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, and Leader, I want to thank you uh, for the work that you've put in and the, and the comments that you've made here today uh, and the continued work that you've committed to do. I think at this time, uh, you know, we should proceed to voting. And uh, Representative Evans recommends be adopted House Floor Amendment Number 1 to Senate Bill 1863. I will ask, do we have leave? Roll call vote. I think we're good. Welch? Yes. Rita? Yes. Wheeler? No. Arroyo? Yes. Butler? No. Evans? Yes. Manley? Yes. Kusnowski? No. Bain? No. Orley? No. Willis? Yes. Williams? Yes. Harris? On a vote of eight voting yes, five voting no, none voting present. Uh, Senate Bill 1863, House Floor Amendment Number One, recommending be adopted, will be favorably reported to the House Floor. Thank you, Leader Harris.